data in educational settings. To begin with today, we just want to acknowledge that here at Early Start, we are on Dharawal country and Dharawal country extends from the south of Botany Bay right down to, to Nowra area. And here at the University of Wollongong, where Early Start is housed, we have a, a really special place in Dharawal country at the base of Mount Kira. And we acknowledge that, that these lands that we're on have always been a place of tremendous learning. And as we are nestled underneath the Grandmother Mountain, we, we thank the country that we're on for the knowledge that it provides. And we certainly pay our respects to Aboriginal people and elders past, present and emerging. It's with great pleasure today that we welcome a terrific panel to focus on collecting data in educational settings. The purpose of this seminar series is to showcase the expertise that we have here at Early Start, but to also share our networks beyond Early Start as well, and to bring into the conversation the wealth of, of knowledge and experience that we have in different research methodologies focused on early childhood and educational settings. So for today, our, our focus is looking at educational research in educational settings. And for many of our colleagues, that's an area that they often want to talk to us about. How is it that we actually get into educational settings? What is it that we do there? And what is it that we do afterwards? So in order to respond to that, we've put together a tremendous panel of expertise. We have Dr. Mitchell Parker, who is a member of our School of Education here at UOW. And Mitch, as an early career researcher, came to us to do his PhD with extensive experience in early years education. His research is focused on looking at teacher and students in their classrooms, and he has particular expertise with classroom-based ethnography. We also have Dr Lynn Cronin, who works in our early years program in the School of Education here at UOW. And Lynn is an experienced educator and, and came to UOW with a wealth of experience and has really made her way in, in trying to capture the different perspectives of children and teachers in different settings and has looked at some novel ways of being able to collect those, those data. We also have Professor Mary Ryan with us from ACU. Very grateful, Mary, for you taking some time out of your very busy schedule as Executive Dean of Education and Arts at ACU. Mary has an extensive research history looking at writing pedagogy, the works of teachers, and has enormous experience working alongside teachers in their classrooms and providing responsive professional learning. So I'm sure you'll agree that we're in for a real treat today. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Mitch. Thank you, Lisa. Although I can't seem to share screen, ah, because you were sharing screen, sorry. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. I would also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land I'm on, the Darawal people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I feel very connected to the topic of today's discussion in, in two ways. Firstly, my previous roles as a teacher and school leader in early childhood and primary classrooms, which has motivated me to research in classroom spaces. And secondly, my experiences as a qualitative researcher and my interest in spatial theories. So today I'm going to talk about some of my experiences in collecting data in classrooms, but with a focus on my evolving understandings about space. I'm going to draw from two studies, a study that I'm currently working on where we're exploring flexible learning spaces and my specific role on this project is within the qualitative research component and collecting ethnographic da data in classroom spaces. As we're collecting those data, we're considering Henry Lefebvre's conceptual triad for space. So we're collecting data on the perceptions of the space, the way the space is conceived or how it comes to be, and the lived space or what happens in the space and how it's actualized. The other study I'll be drawing on is my PhD study, where I worked in classroom spaces with teachers to investigate the experiences they facilitated for children's digital writing. But before I move on, I'd like to acknowledge that I don't think in isolation. 
And the perspectives I'm talking about today have come from thinking with my colleagues, many of whom are on this, this slide. When I thought about what to present today, I thought I could move straight into talking about the session focus on data collection, but it's difficult for me to talk about how I collect data without first exploring the theoretical perspectives that inform the types of data that I collect. So I first want to explore some of my theoretical thinking about space. So this is how I see space. This is what's in my head, a big tangled mess. I see space as this entanglement of elements, an entanglement of objects, people, furniture, and the spaces between them, but also the thoughts, feelings, movements, and sounds that are part of space. There's so much going on. So for me then, space is like a living organism. The space itself has an influence on the people within it, and the people within it have an influence on the space. So my job as a researcher of space is to unpick this entanglement and find out how it works without losing sight of it. There is the temptation, and I know there definitely has been in my work, to turn this into a linear thing. But in doing so, we lose this view of the entanglement and the, the richness of it. I've already talked about Henry Lefebvre's theory of space and how that's informed the data collected in the spaces project. The other body of work that's informed my thinking about space and what I see as I collect and analyze data is theories of materiality. As I think about the materiality of space, I think about the people in the space. And in classrooms, they include teachers, children, support staff, school leaders, families, and so many other people. So as I'm collecting data, I'm thinking about whose perspectives are needed and why. I'm also thinking about the resources. I'm thinking about the furniture, the learning materials, such as books and pencils and whiteboards and digital devices, and the resources that are displayed on walls. So again, when I'm collecting data, I'm thinking about the position of these resources and how they're used. And finally, I think about the processes. And this is a broad term I use to describe the action or events in the classroom. The what's happening, the way people move, their embodiment in the space, and their interactions with other people and the environment. Something that I'll show you later in this presentation is how this thinking about processes informs some of the ways that I analyze data. So let's consider some of the types of qualitative data that might be collected in classrooms. And I'd like to acknowledge Lisa Kirvin, Jessica Manti, and Kylie Lipscomb's work in classroom-based ethnographies in informing these approaches. The data collection methods I have on screen are ones that we've used for the SPACES project. When we go into schools to explore flexible learning spaces, we take still photographs of the space so that we can recall what that physical space looks like later. We move around the room and capture video footage on handheld devices. We also have a video camera set up on a tripod in one corner so that we capture the full scope of the space. Although we mostly use that footage to triangulate the footage in the handheld devices. We draw classroom maps, and this happens in two ways. I usually do a quick sketch when I'm on site, but then I go back to the photos and draw up a digital version of the classroom map later. And I'll explore my approaches to classroom maps a, a little bit later. And the last piece of data is semi-structured interviews with teachers, children, and school leaders. They're the perceptions that we've chosen to capture through the SPACES project. Something I want to advocate for here is the benefits of collecting data with colleagues. For the SPACES project, two qualitative researchers collect data on each site visit at the one time. And within the SPACES project, we draw on a, a constant comparative approach where we have a protocol for data collection, we have a planning conversation before each site visit, we collect the data, we analyze the data, and then we use the analysis to reflect on the protocols before the next site visit. 
I'm going to unpack this process a little bit further. So to start off with, we have our planning conversation. And during this conversation, we make decisions about who will collect which data and what each person will focus on as we collect those data. And also, let's be honest, we also check that someone has charged the camera. That's really important. Now, within the Safe Spaces project, we had five cases. So these planning conversations occur before each of those site visits. And we would reflect on our, on our initial analysis from the previous collection and make slight modifications to the protocols. So for example, as I was analyzing video data from the first case, I kept wanting to see the way the children collected resources on their way from the whole group time to their chosen learning space. And I found that this wasn't captured. In our planning conversation then, we discussed this need and made a plan for how we would capture that data in the next site visit and from then on. When we're in schools, we recognize that teachers don't have a lot of time. We usually, we're usually catching them just before school, so we need to work really quickly. This means that one of us sets up the equipment and takes photos of the space, while the other interviews the teacher. We have a really coordinated approach. So then when the lesson starts, what we've found is that we will often capture different perspectives about the classroom in our individual video footage. This became clear after we analyzed data from our first case, where we found that if you look at our footage in isolation from the other, you could get two quite different versions of that classroom. I often capture the teacher actions and the movement of the teacher and the children from one location to the next. Whereas my colleague Jessica will mostly capture the children and what's happening in their immediate space. After we realized that we each had these perspectives in our video data, we formalized these roles and those were the video data that we collected in each site from then on. So as I said earlier, I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about classroom maps because this has been a pivotal data collection method in my research. As an example, these are two classroom maps from one of my cases from my PhD study. In this class, the teacher facilitated digital writing experiences in both her classroom and in the school computer lab. So you can see here how I constructed a bird's eye view map of both showing the positioning of furniture and the resources. On the left, you can see the teacher's classroom with tables and shelves and whiteboards. And on the right, you can see the computer lab with desks, desks around the outside walls and desktop computer stations. As I was analyzing data from this case, I was thinking about that theoretical frame from earlier and the people, resources, and processes within this space. And I particularly wanted to know more about the movement in these physical spaces. So I physically mapped the movement. You can see here the different colors, colored lines for the teacher and the different children and arrows to show their trajectories. For the experience shown in the classroom space, the children use portable Chromebook devices for their writing. And in the computer lab, they use fixed desktop computers. What you can see then is very different movement patterns. Children moved around the classroom space a lot more, and the corresponding video data for that session showed that they interacted more with other children as they moved around with their portable devices. In the computer, but, but then in the computer lab, they tended to stay a lot more fixed with only a, a few movements around the space. But also the movement of the teacher was different. In the computer lab, the teacher's movements are quite sequential. She move, mostly moves up and down the rows, assisting each child one by one. Whereas in the classroom, she initially moves around the classroom to support children with resources and then positions herself in one spot for the rest of the lesson. Children then bring their Chromebooks to her for assistance. So the movement maps showed that the teacher interactions with children were quite different depending on the spaces and the resources. 
Now, my point here isn't necessarily about the difference in these two spaces and how they were used. My point is that mapping movement in this way has, has huge affordances for how we analyze data and understand classroom spaces. In particular, there were findings that came from the maps that I hadn't picked up on in the video data alone. It was only through representing the movement on, on the maps like this that some of the findings became clear. I thought long and hard about how I would record this data. In the end, I used a stylus on an iPad and recorded the lines as I watched the video second by second. At first, I thought this was a really messy way to do it, but then I realized that movement is messy and capturing the data in this way shows part of that entanglement that I talked about earlier. So as I move forward, I still have a lot of questions about space. I'm thinking about this idea of flexible learning spaces and whether the physical space promotes the flexibility or if the teacher promotes the flexibility or both. Does a teacher work in a more traditional classroom but using pedagogies that promote the flexible use of space still achieve that flexibility. I'm also thinking about the ways the physical and virtual spaces interact. And I'm thinking about how different interactions occur in different types of educational spaces, schools, early childhood settings, and community spaces such as museums and libraries. And I'll finish off there and pass over to Dr. Lynn Cronin to continue the conversation. Thanks, Mitchell. That was very fascinating. I enjoyed your presentation. I will share my screen now. Hopefully you can see that. Yep. Okay, thanks. So thanks for having me today. I'm going to share with you how I went about collecting data for my PhD study and some lessons I learned along the way, or that went a bit quickly. So basically, in a nutshell, I examined how children negotiate literacy practices in an early childhood setting. And then in the early stage one or kindergarten setting. So what literacy opportunities were available for children in each setting? And then the implications that arose for them as literacy learners as they transitioned from one setting to another. So basically, this was my topic. And I will start sharing some of those data collection with you now. So the Participants were children, seven children in phase one, which was the pre for this for the intention purposes of this presentation, I'll refer to preschool and to kindergarten. So we had seven five-year-olds in the preschool and two early childhood teachers. And these children were in their last weeks of preschool and then they were transitioning into the same primary school around about three months later. So those same seven children and then four school teachers. So I was very privileged to be able to research with children in the early childhood setting and the success of my data collection really depended on those relationships that I built with the children because the crux of my study was about getting their perspectives. Um, excuse me. So as a PhD student, this was my very first research project, my first time collecting data. So as you can imagine, there were um, a few hiccups and some mistakes along the way, but basically we had success in the end. So my research was about gaining their perspective. So it was really crucial that they felt at ease with me to be able to share that. So in this setting, I was fortunate to have already built a relationship with the two centre directors. So that reciprocal sharing of information and ease of access into the setting was already there. And it was quite easy for me to get that. So today, for the purpose of this short presentation, I'll focus on the data that I collected in the preschool. So the core data for my research was the creation of individual digital stories for each child. The data that supported that were unstructured interviews and focus group interviews with both the children and the teachers and document analysis. You can imagine in the school setting, there was quite a few documents. And in the early childhood setting, there was two documents, the framework and the teacher's program and the learning journal. So that information triangulated with these other data to 
I guess, see what, what literacy, what was going on in terms of literacy, what was supposed to be going on in terms of literacy, what I actually observed to be going on, and most importantly, what the children thought of the literacy opportunities and what they were experiencing within the centre. So that was also collected through observations. I documented field notes, audio recordings and photographs. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that now. So basically, the unstructured interviews with the children and the teachers were interwoven during the observations. So as Yin tells us that it's really important to give children an opportunity to talk freely about the activities that they're engaging with. So that was important for me to think about when I was collecting that information. So I'd ask them like open-ended questions. I noticed that you are, can you tell me about? So I really immersed myself in the setting when the children were at play, experiencing the literacy opportunities available. I had those open-ended conversations with them. I audio recorded those conversations so I could analyse that data la la later. I took photographs of the children participating in the experiences and those photographs were very much child-directed. So they would choose what, what it is that they were participating in and then I would take those photographs of them and I'd jot down some field notes as well. The morning times were the times that were really important in this early childhood setting. That was the time when the children were fresh, they were in the outdoor area, and they had free choice of what experiences that they wanted to, to do, what, what they'd like to participate in. Uh, so arriving at the centre first thing in the morning was, was a good thing because it meant that I could really tap in also to the parents and chat to them about the study, provide the information sheets and the consent forms. And it also gave me opportunities to have those unstructured interviews with the teachers as well. What was, you know, how they organised the centre, some background information about the children's interests and strengths and so on. So then the focus group interviews Focus group interviews were really beneficial for this age group because, you know, as, as you know, with children, some of them are really chatty and talkative and really happy to, to tell you anything and others are quite, you know, less inclined to, to offer that information as Creswell points out. So this was especially true, true for, the, for my little seven children that I worked with. Some of their language skills were quite advanced and they loved to tell me everything that was going on and others were quite reserved and it was hard for, hard for me at first to, to get some information, have those conversations with them. And I was also mindful that in those focus groups that you know sometimes children just tend to agree with each other so some of the things that I had to consider there so in order to create or to get the children talking in the focus group I created a sample digital story and I created this from photographs that I'd taken in that week you know, the first few weeks where I was building the, the relationship with the children. So I'd talk to them, take photographs of what they're doing, and I'd put it together in a digital story, my first time making one as well. And I scripted it. So I used the term, we use words in preschool. So I wanted to, to give them a model of what they would be working towards in creating their own digital story with my support. But also I wanted this to act as a stimulus for discussion in our focus group. So when I played the digital story for the children, there was lots of conversation about, oh, that was me, I was doing this. And that, that really allowed us to get into what they thought then about those experiences. So then that led to, after getting to know everyone, the sample digital story creation and the focus groups, I spent the morning with each individual child to create their personal digital story. So basically all the photographs that I'd taken of, the, of them during those conversations and unstructured interviews with them were downloaded on my computer. Then they chose the photographs that they wanted for their digital story. We then downloaded those images into iMovie and they set the order of those images. And then they had to compose an oral script to go with those images. And then we needed to record that. So 
in looking at the photographs and having a chat with the child at this time, you know, what you know, what were you doing here? Trying to sort of jog their memory, tell me about what was happening and so on. They created an oral script that went with the image. Then the oral script was recorded. We recorded that together. And then the fine part of that was then me kind of putting it together at the end and exporting it into a QuickTime movie. So as you can imagine, in, in that creation of the oral script with the children, there was, you know, sometimes there was re-recording and the children would go to record and then, you know, maybe some of them would forget what they were going to say. And, you know, so it, it took a little bit of time to go through this process. And there were some considerations about that that I want to share with you now. So basically, we had to view the photographs, choose the images to use, remember what was happening in the images, compose the script, remember and record the script, and then create that story together. So I guess it took about 45 minutes, give or take, for this process, up to an hour usually. When you're thinking about the age of the participants, and some other things that we needed to consider. First of all, finding a quiet space. Now that was a bit challenging in an early childhood setting. Most of the spaces are there designated for children. But fortunately in this space, the children in the morning session were outside. So it was outside play. So what was available for us was the inside room. There were no breakout spaces. So basically we found a quiet corner in the inside space to set up the laptop and pop down with, with an individual child to start this process. Of course, at times that wasn't ideal because it was the morning and it was, you know, children and families coming in in bits and pieces. So it's a little bit of noise going on in the background and distractions as well. The time required, as I said, up to an hour. So sometimes children's attention to the task wandered. For some children, they were very attentive. And for others, there was distractions. They could see their friends out playing. Sometimes their friends would pop by and want to know what was going on. And there was only one child that actually kind of halfway through said, oh, you know, I want to go and play. So that was okay. And I was mindful that I needed to check in with them. Is it okay to do this with you now? Taking them away from the play area to do this also sometimes caused some negotiation. But, you know, it all, all worked out and that little one went away and, you know, we made a time time to come back come back later also their conversational development as I said before so the the composing of the script the recording of the script for some children it was quite short I like reading Christmas books and for some children they really talked about the context of what was happening and the content of the stories and there was some some richer information and I think that's why you know, it was important to triangulate that that data with the other aspects, the photographs, the the other data that I collected as well, to get a rich picture of the perspectives of each of the children. Now, the research of time constraints was mainly because of the nature of the research, which was transition. So these children were in their last few weeks of their preschool. So that was, I guess, around November. And there was lots of Christmas concert practices going on. As I said, the morning sessions were the time that were important to be there. So, you know, it took quite a few weeks of, of, of going there in the mornings to, to collect that data and then tapping into the school the following year. One, one day per child or one, one child per day, I think I was trying to say there. So of a morning session seven children and then as I said for, for one little boy coming back and kind of doing in, in, in a few goes so you know what I learned about that there was a lot of things that I learned in the space of collecting that data but all, all rich and all important as a researcher this is an example of a couple of the images that aligned and the children's oral script that went with the images these two you know said quite a bit uh, and what I found was and I won't share that with you today but in the pre in the school setting their compositions were, were more, more extended for most of the children they were able to talk a little bit more and I think that probably too was which was that ongoing relationship that that I built with them over time
So I just wanted to share one of the digital stories with you before I finish. And this was Ivory and Ivory was, and you'll see in her digital story, loved being creative. She talked a lot about the craft and drawing and painting and things that, that she liked to do in her preschool setting. Oops, sorry. Sorry, I just read the chat. Did you not hear that? Not clearly, Lynn. I could hear little bits of it. But oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sure we can reconnect people with you that if they want to see that example. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, no. Well, basically, it, it was just hearing the children's voice was I think for me really powerful in the digital story so I'm sorry you didn't hear that very clearly but the you know the what they bring to what they said about those images and what that meant for you know how they viewed literacy and what was important for them in in the preschool setting was very interesting for me in my study so thank you and I'd like to pass over now to Professor Mary Ryan and I will stop sharing. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Fantastic. Thanks so much, Mitchell. And I just want to check everyone can hear me. Yes, excellent. Thanks, Mitchell and Lynn. Uh, great presentations. I really enjoyed both of those. Mitchell, I used Dev's work myself. And so oh, it was just wonderful to, to listen to your presentation. So thank you. Colleagues, thank you so much for having me. I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm, I'm going to focus specifically on one project today that I'm actually still working on with Lisa, actually. Lisa's on the team. And I'll just kind of take you through that. We used a variety of, of data methods in there. And it, you, you might find it interesting. So the project is around classroom writing and looking at a, a different kind of focus on classroom writing around reflexive decision making, you know, and that really positioning both teachers and young people as decision makers, not just as people or, or children who just follow instruction, but as active decision makers with agency and, and thinking about really for the first time how children make decisions when they write and using that as a way to kind of get at how we can really focus our instruction, our pedagogy around the ways in which children and, and also teachers make decisions around writing and the teaching of writing. So these were my some key questions, thinking about the decision making and and then very much interested in the classroom conditions that enable or constrain those different kinds of ways that, that children make decisions and also the ways that the teachers made decisions about their pedagogy. So it was a, it's an ARC discovery project and I've just accidentally gone forward and it involves schools across New South Wales and Queensland so there were primary schools in both metropolitan and regional areas you can see there the numbers of teachers and students so I started this when I was at Macquarie now at ACU University of Exeter so Deborah Myhill you you may know of Deborah she was involved in the project we had Georgina Barton from Southern Queensland and Lisa from University of Wollongong and then we also brought on some other 
researchers as the project went on. So Jess Manti came onto the project and also Janet Dutton from Macquarie. And also I'd like to acknowledge my wonderful research, senior research assistants across the project, Mariam Kozronajad and, and Lauren Weber as well, who, who have been fantastic. And we've got a number of publications already out from the, the project and we're still publishing from, from these data. So I'd like to just talk a little bit about the, the theory that informed this project, because that very much did inform the way and the types of data we collected. So I'm using Margaret Archer's theory of reflexivity. And this is, Archer is very much concerned about how people make decisions, but how people make decisions within context. So she's she's very interested in those kinds of things that influence the ways that we make big or, or small decisions in our lives. And I was very interested to apply this to the teaching of writing. So she, she talks about personal, structural and cultural emergent properties. And those emergent properties, she talks about those as being very much kind of intertwined. So they very much emerge in relation to each other. So, of course, this really brings to the forefront the importance of context. And so there's no one size fits all. It's always dynamic because, you know, you have a different teacher or different students, it's going to change the dynamics. You have different structures within a school, it's going to change the dynamics. You have different cultural expectations and so forth, it's going to change the dynamics of decision making in that context. So, the personal is all about the what it suggests, you know, so individual teachers in particular, but also we looked at students when they approach writing. But in terms of the pedagogy, you know, personal beliefs, understandings, motivations, the prioritization from individuals, knowledge. So it was important for us to look at teacher knowledge in this space around teaching writing. So all of those things that are, the, are related to the individual. And then the structural emergent properties are those structures, systems, timetables, time itself, resources, curriculum, assessment, all of those things that are structures, you know, structural conditions, if you like, in that context. And then the cultural, which are kind of the ideologies, you know, those expectations, the norms of, of the department, of the school, of the parents, of the media, of NESA, you know, all of those things that circulate around this context and of course are going to inform what happens in this context. So of course, because I'm using this kind of theoretical approach, it was important for me to and for the team to think about how we collect the data within these contexts and that we know that it's not going to be a one size fits all and that we need to capture the messiness and, you know, the dynamics of those different classroom environments. And importantly, to think about teachers in terms of decisions that they make that, that are sustainable for them in these contexts. So, you know, don't just grab something off a shelf, think about what's going to work for you in this context and understanding yourself and so forth, and, you know, so you can think about why you're making the decisions you are and, and how, you know, you might make decisions differently. So this was really a co-designed, so it was a discovery project, but it was built into that were elements of, we call them classroom innovations, and they were, they were really co-designed professional learning opportunities, I suppose, for those teachers. So we collected data in the first year, and then we, um, we really went back to the teachers with the data, and so that they could start to make informed decisions about how they might plan a way forward for their professional learning because we know that if you just try to impose things on teachers it's not going to be sustainable it's you know if they just go to one-off sessions on professional learning we know it's not necessarily sustainable it doesn't necessarily have an impact on their practice we know it needs to be 
timely. It needs to be relevant to them specifically. It needs to be related to what they're doing now. It needs to be ongoing and iterative, and it needs to be informed by evidence. So we, we really tried to take those things into account and, and to use our opportunities as researchers to collect data that would be useful for these teachers and then engage with them around the data and then you know start to move forward as they generate data analyze data for themselves and think about what they want to do in their classroom situation so we had a writing questionnaire we gave to students to to think about for them to think about what kind of writers they were in terms of how they make decisions when they write so th this was really interesting and it, it was just kind of a first step in terms of how they see themselves and then we shared that with teachers who sometimes agreed and sometimes didn't agree with how the students thought they operated as writers so really we said to the teachers this is not this this survey even though we've you know, we've validated the, the survey. It's really not a, you know, this is the kind of writer your these students are, and that's kind of the end of it. It was, this is to, to really prompt discussions with the students about their writing and about them as writers. So it provided a really nice way for the teachers to start talking to the students about them as writers and to create that dialogue, which we found was so important around this kind of classroom work. So we did a lot of, so we used an ethnographic method methods really look we we did classroom observations that we, we videoed the students and the teachers took did video tours of of their spaces this was a lovely suggestion from Lisa and and Lisa and Jess are currently analyzing some of those data for us we did interviews with teachers and students we collected lots of writing samples and and analyzed those so we we have collected quite a lot of data and then we did the, the classroom innovations or that that co-designed professional learning in the space because you know we just the part of the almost the mantra of this project was you know it's a, it's about context it's not a it's not a one size fits all and we're really trying to enable teachers to have agency around their own learning and their own pedagogy so some key things that you know we started to talk to the teachers about were around knowing yourself you know so in terms of those emergent properties that Archer talks about one of the things as a teacher you need to know about is yourself what is your what's your knowledge base here you know do you have a good knowledge of language you know and some teachers had to be you know they were really honest about it and said actually I do need to brush up a bit on my knowledge about language because the uh, let's face it the English language is hard you know it's it's hard to remember all the grammars and all of the you know the the sentence structures and all of the rest of it and and teachers you know they some of them did need to brush up on on their knowledge about language and you know how do you approach writing how do you feel about writing and you know some of the teachers at the beginning actually if, like they didn't really like teaching writing because they didn't feel confident you know they didn't feel that they could confidently write themselves and then they're trying to teach young people to write so knowing yourself was a really important thing for them to do and to think about and to analyze know your students of course and this is where we started with these, you know, the, the questionnaire or the survey that we gave to the students. You know, what kinds of writers are they? How do they view themselves as writers? And what kind of writing do they engage in? And, and you know, how, and we, we kind of asked some questions about why they made particular choices in their writing. So we'd use their writing as prompts and we'd ask them about that. And so we wanted the teachers to really start to understand their students around writing and, and have that dialogue. So we wanted to create those dialogic opportunities in the classroom for the for the teachers to talk to the students. And, and part of that, of course, became about giving feedback in writing, which we, we found was just so important in the teaching of writing and the literature, the international literature tells us this too, that the type of feedback you give is, is just so important. It's, you know, it can't just be about form or the type of language that's in the writing it's it has to be about function you know what work is that language doing in this text you know so it's all about meaning and not just about you know whether you've used a good adjective or not so you know we really tried to to talk to the teachers about that and then of course know your context you know what's what's the culture of writing like at the school and and what are those things that they felt enabled or constrained 
constrained them. You know, some of that's around that the standardized testing, you know, some of the, there were various different things that that came out as enablements and, and constraints for the teachers. You know, we wanted to know about commercial writing programs because, you know, we found that there was, you know, when teachers don't feel confident or they're busy, it's easy to grab something off the shelf. And, you know, the we found in some schools when they did that, it really had a detrimental effect on their writing outcomes. And, and you know, so this whole sense that you can pick bits and pieces from those programs, but don't just follow a program as planned, you know, without thinking about it in terms of your context, your students and, and what they need. So this is part of the co-design, you know, so we we did those interviews prior to that. We, we did the classroom videos and this Elan, Elan was software that was actually fabulous in terms of presenting this to teachers and thinking about what to do, because what it, what we were able to do with the Elan software was take the classroom videos and then break them down according to the time spent on the different activities in the classroom. So we could we could break down how much time was spent, was, was dominated by the teacher, how much was dominated by the students, how much time the students got to actually write and how much time the teachers spent, you know, on particular kinds of talk. So then we could analyse that in even finer grain detail around what the talk was about. Was it management talk? Was it writing talk? And then if it was writing talk, what what kind of writing talk was it? Was it about the ideas? Was it about, you know, the 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 grammar? What is was it about sentence structure? Was it about purpose or audience? You know, so we we could really get down to that level of detail and it was actually fantastic, just so illuminating. And when we showed it to the teachers, they were really quite blown away, actually, to, to see this in, in such detail. And it really made a difference to the kinds of action plans they created to move forward in their professional learning. So they started to make action plans. You know, they they looked at the students, how the students saw themselves from, from that survey. We looked at writing samples, the kinds of things that their students were doing or weren't doing in their writing, interviewed students. We shared some of that with the teachers too. And, you know, and then we, we looked afterwards at the teachers' perceptions around the, the professional learning because they, a lot of them had lacked confidence beforehand. And so we wanted to really get a sense of how they were feeling about that after the, the co-design process. So these are some of the key things the teachers wanted to focus on. So time was an absolute focus because they it was a real constraint for them, just not having enough time. Writing takes so much time to do. But one of the key things we found is that going through all of the writing samples and across students' writing books and also we found so many pieces of writing that were unfinished we we found it very hard to find even one piece of writing for every student that was actually a complete text so many of them were just like the start of a text or maybe one or two paragraphs and, and that was it because of the time thing and you know no time to go back and revisit purpose of writing having an authentic purpose using authentic text was a big focus and then the types of pedagogy they were using but this is just related to the ELAN and I just wanted to show there was a, a real marked improvement in from 2019 to 21. So the teacher time was quite considerable when we first collected these data. So in one case we had in a lesson, it it didn't wasn't until 25 minutes into the lesson that anything about writing happened. So 25 minutes of management, of organization, of all and the teachers couldn't believe it like they were kind of I didn't even realize I did that you know it's it was so good to show them these data and you know we didn't have to really say much about it we could show them the data and they kind of went oh my god I need to do something about this and so then you know really improved by the by 21 you know, two years later you know there's a lot more collaboration you know there was significantly less time spent on teacher talk and even though there was still teacher talk which of course you'd expect there was much more variation in the talk it was more about writing rather than about management and so you can see the amount of writing went from 50 percent to 80 percent of the talk was about about writing in in the second sort of, of data collection so it was really exciting to see that change in in the teachers and so 
we found, you know, the, the co-design process was really helpful in responding to those emergent properties. You know, we really kept that theoretical framing in, in our minds around all of this. And so this co-design helped us to, to kind of respond to those properties, those emergent properties. There was much more creative expression and authentic auth authorship that was happening. And, and the teachers were really, like, they just loved this kind of, support and focus you know we'd go into their classrooms on a fortnightly basis work alongside them help them kind of implement their action plans and they just loved that one of the teachers said to me the other day writing's now become my favorite thing to teach I was so pleased <laughs> even if that's the only outcome I was so pleased like she just really gained in confidence she just loves it now so that was exciting and this is just like we didn't go in there to to sort out NAPLAN, but have a look at the blue line. That's their NAPLAN results after this project. <laughs> we couldn't believe the teachers and the school are so pleased, but like we didn't go in there to fix NAPLAN. We, you know, we basically, we were, we were focusing on good pedagogy in writing and engaging teachers and giving them agency or well, enabling them to have agency. And they just couldn't believe that their NAPLAN results just skyrocketed after the, a couple of years of engaging in this project. So that was kind of a big win as well, because they, they kind of really, the principal then really thought it was very worthwhile as well. Um, and this is, one of the things the teachers said, she, they were just so thrilled. Like they used to say that, that you know, it's really hard to get the, the kids engaged, you know, they're not excited about writing and, you know, they're doing all these really authentic tasks. And so they were, they were so excited about it. You know, they created these real texts, they were sharing them with each other. They were just, it was such a great process for them to go through and to, you know, to feel about writing. Some of the constraints, of course, schools are very busy places, you know, it's, it's really hard, participants drop out, you know, teachers drop out, students don't come there, there are, you know, the, when you're collecting data across several sites, across several, several states, of course, that getting that consistency is, is, you know, really hard, you have to think carefully about protocols around data collection, so you get that consistency, and you have complete data sets across the sites. COVID, of course, has been like this, the whole time this project's been running, we had COVID. So pretty much for the majority of it anyway. So that's been really, really hard given we couldn't get into schools for a lot of that time. So we've had to kind of work around. So that's just a point of, you know, you, you have to work around things that happen in schools when you're collecting data in, in educational settings. And of course, when you're collecting data across several years, you have teachers who get transferred out or teachers that get transferred in or, you know, to students who leave or you have a whole new class next year. You know, do you stay with the teacher or stay with the class? You know, it's there are all these kinds of things that you have to think about in the design of these kinds of projects in educational settings. And I think that's about it. So I'll stop. I've probably gone over time. Sorry about that. What an absolute privilege for us to hear from three such passionate researchers around such really interesting pieces of research that they've done. So a big thank you, Mitch, Lynn and Mary. Really enjoyed those presentations and so many key messages. When I look at my notes, some of the, the consistent messages that came across your stories was the complexity and the messiness of the educational setting, knowing and being clear about what it is that you're going to look at when you go into, into a research setting and having that real clarity and research focus. I'm pleased that you're all nodding that I've heard the right things in your presentations. The need for multiple sources of data and how to capture those and some really novel ways that each of you have captured that data in the settings, knowing the times that matter for the research and being there for those and the need for constant reflection throughout. Mitch, you talked about modification to protocols. Mary, you checked about, talked about getting feedback from the participants in order to design next phases. And Lynn, you talked about checking in with participants regularly. But I think the, the key messages for me really came around the relationships and, and the time. So the time for the research, but also the time that we're asking educators and children to take out of, of their day when every minute matters. I think that you said that, Mary. So some really, really interesting points. I just wanted to pick up on a couple of things and I might just direct a couple of questions if I may. The first one is around that idea of teachers and time. 
So across your stories, we talked about focusing on on issues that they may not necessarily feel comfortable with, like the teaching of writing or the use of technology in classrooms, sharing some confronting findings there and that real desire to increase agency for teachers. So with that little prelude, I wonder, Mary, if you might have some advice for us on how to manage that complex relationship with teachers. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. You know, I think we we really need to respect teachers as professionals and, you know, they, they're so good at so many things and we need to point that out to them. You know, we need to show them what, what and remind them what they're really good at and the fact that we all need to keep learning about lots of things. You know, we're educators and we're lifelong learners. So using, I found that using data to show them some things that are happening in their classrooms meant that they could look at that and and they could make decisions about the things that they could improve as opposed to me just telling them, you know, you need to do this better or you need to brush up on your grammar. You know, they could actually look at that and, and make those decisions themselves using the evidence. So, you know, I, I found that, that that kind of treating them as professionals, treating them with respect and, and you know, enabling that that agency is really important and in terms of the time you know they all say to me oh we just need more time but when I pointed out to them that you know using the data how time was used in a lesson they all kind of went oh okay (laughs) so I can't have more time but I can use my time in better ways you know so that was a really great finding for them to think about that differently. I think that's the value of the data that you captured too, isn't it? Showing where the where the real teaching points came into the lesson. And Mitch, I guess in, in your case too, showing the movement maps and how children were using the space and, and the trajectory of the teacher around that space too is, is really important. We have had a question come through from the from the chat space around how to get consent from young children participating in the research. Lynn, I wondered if you might want to take this one. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Getting consent from children, we went through the parents with the information sheet and the consent form, but also in discussion with the children as well. So it was very much asking the children, explaining to them what was happening and and checking in with them verbally, is it okay? And at every step of the process, I would you know say, is it okay if I you know sit and have a chat with you about what you're doing today? We're going to have a focus group. Is now a good time? Is it okay if we come inside and, and chat here? And when, you know, some of the children said, I I don't want to do it now, I want to play, it was about, you know, that's okay, let me know when is a good time. So it was about getting that written consent from the parents or the carers, but the verbal consent, which was ongoing throughout that the data collection process was also really important. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. And I guess it's what the children don't say as well that that matters too, isn't it, in that consent process as well? Yeah, yeah. It would be really intuitive picking up on them because sometimes they don't say, I don't want to, but you can tell by the way they're kind of, and you go, you know, maybe later. We'll, I need we'll to go to the to toilet this. and I'm hungry. Those yes. sorts of thoughts as well. <laughs> yeah. you know, Definitely, of- but they're such a joy to For sure. And a question for you, Mitch, when you you talked a lot about understanding the context and the importance of that actually was across all of your presentations, but what's the first thing you look for when you enter a setting? When I enter a setting, I know that this is going to, I guess it's not a tangible thing, but for me, it's, it's almost a vibe. I walk in and I think about what's presented on the walls, what resources are in the space, how is the 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 furniture position but but in that initial stage when I walk into the space how is the teacher moving around the space what is the teacher pointing out where is the teacher standing where does the teacher move us as researchers when we go to do the interview all of those things give us insight into what's important to the teacher and how the teacher organizes the space yeah really really important Mitch and at the risk of you know the Dennis Denuto from the castle it's the vibe right the vibe of the space as you go in it's the vibe really important so given that you all spend so much time and and building relationships my final question for each of you is how do you go about exiting a setting as a researcher 
who would like to speak on? I was just going to say that's that's really sad for me to sort of you built those relationships and particularly for me I tracked those children over the year to their primary school setting and they had so much to tell me and so much to say in that setting and then I have to say you know I'll see you what was really hard to exit that setting Mm. Mm. I want to add to that by saying sometimes you don't sometimes you keep those connections and those relationships Mm. there's some teachers from my PhD study that I'm still in contact with and they ask me questions and they talk to me about different areas of research and that's really exciting that that I've been able to maintain those relationships across time. Yeah, I would agree with that too. Both of you actually, Mission and Lynn. And uh, keeping those connections, I think, is really important. And yeah, I'm finding it difficult to ex- ex- extricate myself from my context. So some of the teachers have moved to different schools and, you know, I'm still doing professional learning for them because you know, they were so good in my project that I, you know, I just keep connected with them. They'll call me up and say, can you just do this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of like, you know, you, you kind of stay connected with them, but I, you know, keep them on your network list. I send them out opportunities that might be coming up, you know, so I think, yeah, you don't ever fully kind of leave the context in some cases. No, I, I would agree with that. And perhaps it's a timely plug too for our professional associations and, and thinking around how we can embrace teachers and educators in the professional communities that we're part of as well and, and to maintain relationship with them that way. Big thanks, Mitch, Lynn and Mary for the great presentations and really, really positive and constructive conversations. I know that for those who are with us live and for those that that watch this recording later through our Early Start YouTube channel, there's so many pearls of wisdom there. So thank you for your time. And for those who are regular attendees or viewers of this series, just a plug that our next workshop is looking at ethics of working with children and that's scheduled for Tuesday, the 1st of November. So until then.